we're going live now. We have a couple of minutes here to get uh, settled in before we begin, but it's um, compared to tomorrow, it's a pretty nice day, wouldn't you think? <laughs> tomorrow we might have six, seven inches of snow on the ground, wet snow, heavy wet snow. Or more. Or more. So, so, yeah, this will be a much nicer day than tomorrow. Even though it's uh, cloudy today, <laughs> we'll Excuse take me. this. It's a lot better. Mm -hmm. 10.59. Good well, to see we... some people tuning in already. Hi, Jan. Hi, Saw Steven and Wade. Andrew. Yes. Anita. Yes. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Happy to see you tuning in today. You know, we're really going to appreciate it when we can get back to church and be able to see people face to face. That's right. It'll just be so much, so much better. It, it's just hard to believe that it's been a month. The 13th of April is when we canceled church for the first time. So. Well, let's begin. It's 11 o'clock. Hi, Patty. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. We're going to have uh, a program for you, just a living room program. Welcome to the Mayberry Living Room. You know, when we moved into this house, everybody in town, uh, we'd say where we the house we had just moved into, oh, the Schmidt house, they say. But now it's the Mayberry house. <laughs> and so welcome to the Mayberry, Mayberry house. Yeah. Uh, we've enjoyed having you with us uh, over the past three weeks. In fact, this is the fourth Sabbath now since the, that Friday the 13th that changed everything. Mm -hmm. We got that, the governor's announcement. And for those of you in Wyndham, I just went over, we went over to Wyndham on the 13th and I decorated at the church. Would you believe it? And then we had to cancel. Yeah. So, so it's all ready for the... For spring. For spring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we've, we've uh, had, some of you have been able to join us for the midweek services as well. So it's good to, good to be back again uh, with you. Uh, even though there's a big distance in between us. Good morning, Michael, Dr. Mike, and oh, uh, nice. Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Yes. So if, um, if you've missed any of the videos or would like to share them, they are posted on a YouTube channel, and the link is... Southwest District MNSDA. Yeah, and the link you could find on my my Facebook site. That'll you can click on it. It'll take you right there. Well, we've had uh, another full week. We we don't have any problem keeping busy. We did That's do true. some yard work. Um, Ken mostly this week. He did the. <laughs> I can't take much credit for it. <laughs> I was working You were inside. out helping some. But he cut down, there was a lot of um, little volunteer trees under the evergreens on the west border of our property. And he went in and, and cut all of that down with the chainsaw. And the neighbor came out and he was really pleased to see, to see him doing that. Um, he says, you, you cleaning up? And, and I said, I, mean, I thought he said, you need some help. <laughs> <laughs> so but that, no, he was saying, I just clean it up. He was uh, glad to see that. So I piled all of the, those trees. It was a huge pile. I piled up next to the curb and I'm going to load it into the uh, trailer and take it around to the burn pile. This The community has a burn pile just around the corner. And uh, started this project on Monday and worked on it Tuesday and then uh, raining Wednesday and I thought you know I better get that loaded up I don't know when I'm gonna be able to get it to the burn pile because they only have it 
open. One hour on Saturday and one hour on Sunday. Yeah. And so. what? And this is Easter Sunday. I don't know if they're even going to have it open. Yeah. So I thought, well, at least I'll get it in the trailer. And I started loading it into the trailer and uh, piled up, climbed up on top to tamp it down with my weight. And uh, a lot of trees. A lot of. <laughs> And I still had another trailer load when I was doing this. And uh, this fellow came up with his truck and he had a trailer behind him. And he said, pull over, just uh, move move out of the way and I'll help you. He said, you better go and before the guy leaves. So I got into, my, uh, into the vehicle and I whipped around the corner and there was, the gate was open. And I unloaded my trailer and then he came with his trailer loaded with uh, more of my trees and then and then I was going to go help him and he says he said I got this I got this you go you, you still got a little load left so I went back and there was a little little bit left and what what timing that was to to get that started and you looked out the window and yeah I peeked out the kitchen window to see <laughs> you know how's he doing out there and it's like wait a minute that's a different there's a pickup out there and that's a different man loading up <laughs> wood so yeah. I thought well what a nice neighborly thing to do yeah um and and it was just just kind of a providential thing that um that he came along and he knew that the burn the burn pile gate was open, and so I thought that was really nice that he came and helped Ken. Yeah, so. we've been missing our grandkids, and mm -hmm. uh, but it's nice once in a while to get a the a FaceTime FaceTime lights up and. <laughs> I'll look, I'll look at my um, phone or iPad, and it's like missed call, missed call, missed call, missed call, and it's like oh, I think Kale's been <laughs> Kale's trying to been get a hold of us. Yeah. So yesterday I called back to see what I'd missed and and our daughter she said, "Oh, that was Kale." So I I called him and we FaceTime for a while and and he showed me his room and I showed him my room I've been working on, my sewing craft room and and then I read him a book. I said, "Here, I I've, I've got this uh Tadpole to a Frog book." Should we read that? And he thought that was a good idea. So <laughs> he could nice. see the pictures. And so it was nice. You, you have to get creative in how you um, spend time with your loved ones these That's days. That's true. Well, they've been telling us that this is the worst week of the COVID-19 crisis. Mm -hmm. This week and next week, possibly. And uh, the New York Times uh, has a, a running total and uh, as of yesterday evening, worldwide, 1,645,000 cases uh, of the virus. And we know there must be more than that that mm -hmm. weren't counted. And um, a sobering number, 101,000 deaths worldwide so far from this crisis in 177 countries. Mm -hmm. And here in the United States, uh, as of Friday, 492,962 people had been tested positive and uh, 18,466 deaths. Mm. Uh, that's, that, that makes 9-11 uh, pales in comparison. And uh, even think about the tsunami in Indonesia a while back, mm -hmm. and this is just this is just our deaths here in the United States. Here in Minnesota, we've had uh, one thousand three hundred thirty-five cases and fifty-seven deaths. But as we look at our Southwest District area, the Southwest District of Minnesota, uh, in our area there have been no deaths. We can thank the Lord for that. Um, there have been four deaths in Martin County, just south of us, which is over on the east, uh, just just over from the east corner of our district. And uh, but most of the the deaths are up in the Twin City area. But when you stop and think about it, 
this is the worst week for Jesus too. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus went through the Garden of Gethsemane and his death on the cross for us, that was the worst week. But it was the best week in another way. It was the best week for the world and for the universe because Satan was defeated when Jesus died on the cross and uh, made it possible for all these people, all of these deaths, to have the hope of, the, of eternal life to come. And that's what we want to talk about a little more this morning. <clears throat> but uh, first, we want to uh, thank you for your faithfulness in, in returning your tithes and offerings, and uh, we know that the Lord will continue to bless. We, we'll, uh, our church still needs uh, uh, funds to be able to keep going, and, uh, and also the pastors, Bible teachers in our conference are depending upon you for, for that, for, for their, their uh, salaries. And so we just thank you for, uh, for remembering that, going to uh, AdventistGiving.org is the place where we can give our offerings and tithes. It's just like filling out a tithe envelope there. Or some of you are keeping it aside and uh, sending it in or waiting until the opportunity to, to send it in. And so we just appreciate your faithfulness in doing that. Well, let's, let's sing some kids' songs, shall okay. we? Um, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, let's, let's sing, whoa, it's a little sh sh close, you gotta but watch him when he's here we got go. That in his, his banner over me is love. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. He lifts me up. Sing with us. He lifts me up into heavenly places, his banner over me is love. He lifts me up into heavenly places, his banner over me is love. He lifts me up into heavenly places, his banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock of my salvation, his banner over me is love. Jesus is the rock of my salvation, His banner over me is love. Jesus is the rock of my salvation, His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. See, what's another one? I don't know, I'm blank. <laughs> He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. Jesus is the vine. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. His banner over me is love. Jesus is the vine and Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. How about do Lord? I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Way beyond the blue. Do 
Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Way beyond the blue. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took <coughs> as my Savior, you take him too. While he's calling you. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. we're singing and I see all the birds and we've got some squirrels that are raiding the bird yeah. feeders so I'm, they keep catching my eye <laughs> <laughs> good to have you with us Mac and Shannon let's sing this is a, a favorite a song that's a favorite of uh, the kids always ask for this song the crayon box <laughs> I was a little child, no higher than your knee. My mother bought a box of crayons just for me. Well, I picked them up and I opened them up and I looked way down inside. And the colors, they reminded me of Jesus when he died. Red is the color of the blood that he shed brown is for the crown of thorns they placed upon his head on his head now blue is for royalty in which he did dwell yellow is for the christian who's afraid to tell well i colored and i colored till the crayons were all gone and though I am much older now, the memory lingers on. So when I see a little child with crayon box in hand, I tell him what they mean to me and hope he'll understand, understand that red is the color of the blood that he shed. Brown is for the crown of thorns he placed upon his head, on his head. Now blue is for royalty in which he did dwell. Yellow is for the Christian who's afraid to tell. Afraid to tell of a Savior who died on Calvary. Who died for all the lonely sinners. Just like you and me Someday he's coming back Back to be our king And the colors of the crayon box You will see, you will see that Red is the color of the blood that he shed Brown is for the crown of thorns They place upon his head, upon his head now Blue is for royalty in which he did dwell. Yellow is for the Christian who's afraid to tell. Well, we'll put the guitar away and we're going to sing a song entitled Whiter Than Snow. Because that's what, that's what Jesus... Uh, 
It's actually, it comes from the psalm, from Psalm um, that uh, 51, I think it is, where David says, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And uh, because of Jesus' death on the cross for us, we can uh, have that today. I'm going to get a little drink too. <clears throat> This is actually the first song that Ken and I sang together a number of years ago. Yes. Now we need to turn that, push that button up there. Turn it on. There we go. Jesus, you came down from heaven to earth, gave up your life so that I would be worth more to the Father than I'll ever know. Washed in his blood, I am whiter, whiter than snow, whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, whiter than snow. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. I was a sinner when I was conceived. How you could love me is hard to believe. You want the truth in my transition between the time when we had our snow and the springtime we remember both of those things that we're quieter than snow and we can have the new life of spring because of Jesus death for us on the cross that's what this season teaches us and uh, it has for thousands of years the change of the seasons the Passover the winter bondage and then Passover and then the the summer drought and and then the tabernacles at the end of the year looking forward to Jesus soon coming. And winter doesn't always let go so easily. We may be seeing some snow tomorrow. One last 
One last verse. Yeah, there's song. a lesson in that too, that uh, the devil doesn't give up without a fight. Yeah. And, uh, but he never, he's not going to, Jesus has already won the victory and he's already been defeated. And so yeah. just like we know that winter will be gone very soon. Satan also has been defeated. Well, let's bow our heads for just for a moment of prayer before we begin our message. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this special time of the year that reminds us of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you for the victory that Jesus won for us on the cross. We thank you for the everlasting message of the gospel and the hope that we have in the midst of this crisis that this too will be gone and defeated. And so we ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us. We pray you'll be with each one that is, that is watching. Be with our families. Be with our friends. And please bless them wherever they are. And uh, draw us closer to you and to one another. We thank you for all that you have done and will do as we, one day at a time, we trust in you to take care of us. We put ourselves in your care and keeping. We thank you for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Karen isn't leaving us. She's just going to be... <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> Going a little bit aside, away. She's so. just stepping aside. But uh, I want to take us to a scripture reading. The scripture reading is from Matthew and also from Luke. Matthew 27, beginning with verse 20, 39. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. In Luke 23, 39, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him, rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, Remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. The people of God are called to be a light to bring the message of the three angels that's right in the center, in the heart of the book of Revelation to the people of our communities. And at the heart of that message <clears throat> is the good news of the everlasting gospel. John saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to every kindred, tongue, and nation and people. Could it be that the story of these two thieves reveals an aspect of that gospel that we have missed? Two thieves. One was lost and the other was saved. And I used to think one was forgiven and the other was not. 
But is that really so? Could it be that we have a too narrow a view of forgiveness? A view that leads us to feel like we need to take the first step before we can be forgiven. Oh, you have to confess first. Oh, you have to repent first. And this misunderstanding is the result of a failure to see that there are two aspects of forgiveness. The first aspect of forgiveness is the one that we're most familiar with, which is conditional. It's found in 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is talking about personal forgiveness and restoration that has a condition attached to it. If we confess, he is faithful. I like the way it's put in the book Steps to Christ in this chapter uh, on consecration. It says, those who have not humbled their souls before God in acknowledging their guilt have not yet fulfilled the first condition of acceptance. If we have not experienced that repentance, which is not to be repented of, and have not confessed our sin with true hum humiliation of soul and brokenness of spirit, abhorring our iniquity, we have never sought truly for the forgiveness of sin, and if we have never sought, we have never found the peace of God. The only reason why we may not have remission of sins that are past is that we are not willing to humble our proud hearts and comply with the conditions of the word of truth. So there is a conditional aspect of forgiveness. If we confess our sins, not only is Jesus faithful to forgive us just as if we had never sinned, but he was also promised to write his law of love in our hearts and he will make us more like him every day. But the condition is, is if we will come and confess our sins, he will forgive us. But if this is all we have, we may think that we then have to take the first step. We must first confess before he can forgive us. We must first repent before we are forgiven. And there is a sense in which this is true, but if this is all we have, we can end up with a legalistic view of salvation. But there's a broader aspect of forgiveness that we must see if we're going to fully appreciate the salvation that we have in Jesus and the infinite love that God has for us. Before we can confess our sins, God has already in Christ taken the first step. And this broader aspect of forgiveness is God's forgiveness in Christ, our substitute and surety for the whole human race. No one is left out. Let's go to Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 6. Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, where? In heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted, how? In the beloved. Now, there are some Christians that would have us believe that this, is, this only applies to the elect. This only applies to the chosen ones. They believe that only a select group have been predestined to eternal life. And uh, there's a limited atonement. Jesus only died for that select group. 
Now, we must admit that Paul here is writing specifically to the elect. But what he is, what, but what he is saying applies to everyone, the elect in Jesus. He made us, the whole human race, no one left out, accepted in the beloved. Oh no, they say, Jesus didn't die for the whole human race. He only died for those whom he predestined to be saved. But John tells us in 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, there's that big word, which means sacrifice of atonement. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So Jesus died for the whole world. He is the propitiation for the whole world. So were both thieves on the cross included in that propitiation? Yes. So when Paul tells us in Ephesians 1 verse 4 that the Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, was he talking about both thieves? Yes. He's talking about the entire human race. Now, that doesn't mean that the entire human race will be saved. That's what we refer to as a universalism. The Bible doesn't teach universalism. It's sad, but the majority is going to reject the blood-bought pardon. Even though it's been provided for everybody, Jesus is the propitiation for the entire human race, the majority will reject it. But, nevertheless, we were all chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We were all predestined to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to God. In Christ, we were made accepted in the beloved. That is the good news of the gospel. Your name, my name, and everyone's name was written there in that book of the Lamb, the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Both thieves' names had to be written in that book. Let's look at Romans 5, verse 6 to 8. It says there, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Does that not include both thieves? That includes you and me as well. And everyone else in the world. When we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would dare, even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus was dying for both thieves because he had forgiven them both long before they were even born. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. <coughs> I'm going to get a little drink of water here. As we go back... <clears throat> To the Garden of Eden, Adam has just taken a bite from the forbidden fruit. God had said, on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Why did Adam and Eve not die that very day? It was because the lamb, slain from the foundation of the world, took their place. Jesus, the Son of God, the second Adam, stepped into the gap with his grace and forgave Adam. And in Adam, the whole human race, placing us all under grace. Listen to this from a little book, one of my favorite books on, on salvation by faith. It's called Faith and Works. 
It says, the moment that Adam refused obedience to the laws of God's kingdom, that moment he became disloyal to the government of God and he made himself entirely unworthy of all the blessings with, with which God had favored him. This was the position of the human race after man divorced himself from God by transgression. Then he was no longer entitled to a breath of air, a ray of sunshine, or a particle of food. And the reason why man was not annihilated was because God so loved him that he made the gift of his dear son that he should suffer the penalty of his transgression. Christ proposed to become man's surety and substitute that man, through the matchless grace, should have another trial, a second probation, having the experience of Adam and Eve as a warning not to transgress God's laws they had. This little paragraph opens up a whole new dimension to God's forgiveness, which parallels the scriptures that we are looking at this morning. Jesus stepped in and died in their place. That's why they didn't die that very day that they ate the fruit. They were under grace. They were forgiven. We see the same in Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 14 to 18. And uh, this passage ha is, is, is packed with a lot of good, good thoughts that it, would, it takes some, some study. But there's one verse we especially want to focus on, in verse 18. Let's begin with verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many died, Adam's sin, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Were not both thieves included in this gift of grace? Yes, both thieves. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Just as if we had never sinned. For if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. And now here it is, the verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. How many did judgment come upon? All men. And nobody's left out of that. Through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, and what was that? Jesus giving his life for us, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the free gift came to how many? All men, resulting in justification of life for all men. No one is left out of that. That free gift came to all men as soon as Adam and Eve sinned. No one is left out. Both thieves are included in that gift. The gift of forgiveness full and free came to all humanity. And so it says in Ephesians 2, verse 4, 4 through 10, another passage we want to look at that gives us this picture of this grace that came to us before we even knew about it. Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 10, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, that is, before we even, even heard about it, before you even knew about it, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us a life together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. 
Now, why does Paul add, by grace you have been saved? Because it was together with Christ before you even knew about it, even before you were born. When did, when did he make us alive in Christ Jesus? That happened when Christ was raised from the tomb. Christ represented the human race, and when he rose from the tomb, he made us to live together with him. And, verse 6, raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Now, let me ask you, physically speaking, have we all been raised together and made to sit together in heavenly places? No, not physically speaking. That's why those words were added at the end of, the ver end of verse 6. In Christ Jesus, our substitute and surety, our representative, this has happened. Because he represents us as the representative of the human race. Because he represents us and it is counted that it has happened to us in him. Both thieves included. Verse 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. Grace, unmerited favor. By grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That provision was made for the entire human race. It was already true for us in Christ Jesus. The question remains then, now are you going to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, walk in those good works in which you were created, for which you were created in Christ Jesus? Now that comes to us. Now that comes to the physical reality of us right now. Another passage of Scripture that tells us what has happened to us in Christ Jesus is 2 Corinthians 5, 13-19. Paul says, For if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. In other words, if we're a little out of our minds, it's for God. And... If we are of a sound mind, it's for you, Corinthians. For the love of Christ controls us. That's what makes us the way we are. The love of Christ controls us and compels us because we judge thus that one died for all, therefore all died. How many died? All died. How is that? In Jesus, their substitute. It's counted that Jesus died. When Jesus died, we all died. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And then verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world including both of those thieves, to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God in Christ reconciled the whole human race to himself. And now he has commissioned us to tell the whole world the good news. You have been reconciled to God in Christ Jesus. You may not have even know, realized it. You didn't even know it. Even while you were still his enemies, it happened. But you've been reconciled to God in Christ Jesus. Now you have a choice to make. You be reconciled to him. Accept the gift that he has given to you. Let's go now to the baptism of Jesus. <clears throat> he comes to John, his cousin, as he is baptizing in the River Jordan. And at his request, his cousin buries Jesus beneath the water. And straightway coming out of the water, Jesus saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And then Jesus bows in prayer there on the riverbank. 
and the Savior's glance seems to penetrate heaven as he poured out his soul. He pours out his soul in prayer. What must Jesus' prayer have been considering the answer that he got? Think about that. He knows very well how sin has hardened the hearts of men and how difficult it'll be for them to discern his mission and accept the gift of salvation. And so he pleads with the Father for power to overcome their unbelief, to break the fetters with which Satan has enthralled them, and in their behalf to conquer the destroyer. He asks for the witness that God accepts humanity in the person of his Son. That wonderful book on the life of Jesus, Desire of Ages, we find this on page 111. God, he asks for the witness that God accepts humanity in the person of his son. And the father's voice is heard from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Those words embrace all of humanity, both of the thieves on the cross. God spoke to Jesus as our representative. With all our sins and weaknesses, we're not cast aside as worthless because he has made us accepted in the beloved. Both thieves. Is that not good news? Two thieves and two choices. One thief committed the unpardonable sin. He despised the free gift offered to him in Christ Jesus. But the other thief thought, saw by the light streaming from the cross of Calvary that his Savior was dying next to him in his place. And he believed, and he was saved. So there are two aspects of forgiveness. There's the personal forgiveness that is conditional, that comes as we repent and we confess our sins. But there is a broader aspect of forgiveness that comes down to us from the foundation of the world. And in this aspect, we're all born forgiven, born unto grace. But like Jacob and Esau, we have a birthright to cherish or despise. Like to the two thieves on the cross, we have a choice to make. Will we remain in Adam under condemnation and perish? Or will we enter by faith into the second Adam and receive the free gift of eternal life already ours in him? We've all been living under grace, under probation, where every breath we breathe and every heartbeat throbbing in our chest is purchased by the cross of Calvary. Both thieves had their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But one had his name removed that day when he finally and irrevocably rejected the wonderful gift that had been given in Christ. But thank God, we have the hope of, of saying with that other thief, Jesus, please remember me when you come in your kingdom. And we hear him say to us, this very day, I tell you, I'm, I'm telling you, you will be with me in paradise. In Revelation 14, 6, we see an angel, the first of three, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And in Revelation 18, we see another angel, a fourth one, giving a loud cry, illuminating the whole world with his glory, illuminating the world with the everlasting gospel. And at the heart of that everlasting gospel is the wonderful good news that in Christ we were born forgiven, that we have been reconciled to God in Christ Jesus and now we can be reconciled. We can choose to be reconciled in him. Yes, in Adam, under condemnation, but 
completely forgiven in Christ, accepted in the Beloved, given the wonderful opportunity to accept salvation in Him for ourselves. And this complete picture of forgiveness will lead not only to judicial pardon, that we can be justified by faith, but to a complete reclaiming from sin. The people of God have been placed here to proclaim this message in the context of the three angels of Revelation 14, and it's our privilege to choose each day the fate of that second thief who was assured that day of a place in the kingdom of Messiah Jesus. And it's also our privilege to daily extend the gospel invitation to those around us to do the same. Aren't you glad for the wonderful good news of the gospel that we are so privileged to be able to share to the people around us in these last days that brings us hope of eternal life and the free gift that is ours in Christ Jesus. Let's sing a song as we... Would you like to join me here as we sing... The Old Rugged Cross.
been a, a good time for us and we trust it's uh, you've enjoyed it as well and and we look forward to Wednesday night we'll uh, have another time of uh, some singing and prayer and uh, worship and uh, but God bless you in the meantime and and remember because of Jesus death burial and resurrection we know that all sin and suffering and disease has been defeated eternally and there is light at the end God bless you and have a great, uh, week. Have a great week ahead um, and keep praying that we'll get through this um, this time um, very soon that that we won't be tied to our homes um, like we are right now. It's it's hard on a lot of people. They've having to they've had to give up a lot. Um, I just talked to a relative yesterday, and to hear about the things how it has impacted their life, it really um, pa it was a pause for thought. Um, but the but most of all, we we want to stay safe, and we yes. want to um, not cause anyone else to get sick. So we'll exercise just, the golden rule. Yeah. So we'll yeah. get through this one day at a time with God at our side. So. Thank you for your comments, those of you who left comments, and uh, we've been seeing your names go by, and and we uh, it's good to see you join us, and uh, God bless you.